Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons, to King's Bishop Teaches Chess. I'm Coach Daniel, your host, also known as King's Bishop here at chess.com, and I'm bringing another edition of the World Championship Wins video series. It's the series in which we're analyzing those World Championship games that resulted in victory for one player or the other. No draws being considered, even though we admit that some draws can be instructional and exciting, we're just not showing them in this particular series of videos. <clears throat> we just want to see how these champions won their games. Well, this is game 16, and the score stands in the favor of the defending world champion, Wilhelm Steinitz, nine games to six. And each person has had some chance to try to build momentum, but each time the other has broken that momentum. Well, Steinitz is now really <clears throat> Um, making a point, isn't he? He's three games in the lead. And it comes down to the black pieces. Mikhail Chigorin has only managed to win one time with black, whereas Steinitz has now won several times with black. And that's what gives him his advantage. And now he's got quite a, uh, a momentum building. He's knocking on the door of victory. All he needs is 10 and a half points to emerge from the match victorious. And uh, he's already sitting at nine. So that puts a lot of pressure on Chigorin. So we're not surprised to see Knight F3 by the world champion because he's played it every single time that he's had the white pieces. And we're resisting the urge to find this tedious because one interesting thing we have seen from the same openings being played is how these players make little improvements off of the previous event. Well, uh, Chigorin decided to abandon his tact altogether. Um, all but one game, he has played pawn to uh, d5. In only one instance, he played knight to f6. And these games have all transposed into queen's gambit declined variations. But today... Mikhail Chigorin chooses the Dutch variation. Now, let me back up a half a move here because I should mention that the move knight f3 is known nowadays as Reti's opening, named for Richard Reti, who hadn't been born by the time this game was played. I mean, um, Reti was born in... Uh, May of 1889, so it wouldn't be for another three months until uh, Richard Retti's even born. So these players didn't know this as Retti's opening. But the, the appeal of this opening, though it's usually a quiet opening, the appeal is that you're getting the knight to its favorite square and looking at the center while reserving the flexibility of continuing in various ways with these pawns that usually lead the game. So in other words, you can transpose to an English opening. You can transpose to a queen's pawn opening. You can transpose to a king's pawn opening. But it's all dependent on black, isn't it? Uh, the thing about... Knight f3 is you are also granting black a greater variety of choices 
than you would with the um, pawn to e4 opening. So out comes the Dutch variation. And after d4, we have transposed to the actual Dutch defense, and which normally starts with d4 and is answered with f5. And so the Dutch defense might look like a sort of reverse um, Sicilian defense where white plays e4 and black plays c5. Don't um, believe for a moment that even though both pawns prevent the um, formation of the classical pawn center, that's where the similarities end in those two defenses. And the main reason is the fact that the black king is standing exposed on the e8, h5 uh, diagonal. <clears throat> so even though f5 gains kingside space for black, and black has the idea of creating a, an attack on the king's side. And so therefore it's an aggressive opening. Um, the drawback is the exposure of the king. Black is happy to create this imbalance and um, he's happy to control e4 but the weakness sometimes can come back to haunt him. Furthermore, what happens if you move your D pawn? You're creating other weaknesses as well. So there's that liability on top of it. Um, black here responds with E6. <clears throat> And now the question is, how does the queen's bishop get into the game? c4 is the classical variation, knight f6. And <clears throat> this is a84 in the Encyclopedia of Chess Openings. Now, this position has been reached in professional chess uh, over 3,000 times. And of those, really almost 30, probably 35, 3,600 times, of those, G3 has been played 1,616 times. Knight C3 has been played 1,516 times. But this move E3 is very remote only having been played 151 times. D5 is the usual move here, but Bishop E7 is chosen by Black, wanting to get his king castled. Knight C3, kingside castle. Bishop d3 is played uh, 16 times in the database. d5, and here we have bishop d2. Queen c2 or kingside castle are the two main choices here. Bishop d2, I would venture to guess, was brand new at this point. Don't forget, most of chess theory was brand new at this point. But there's only one other game in the database after this. Um, and once we get to this point, we're in unique territory. This is the only game in the database that has reached this position. Knight B to D7. And 
knight to g5 points out why that is pretty much a wasted move. You can see knight b to d7 blocks the bishop's defense of this backward pawn. So, after knight g5, he has to put his knight right back to bed. f3, queen c7, queen c2, knight to h5, attacking the king's knight, <clears throat> sending it on its third move, now to h3, and undoubtedly it's going to have to take up residence on f2, and from there it has not good where to go. Bishop h4 gives check, and you definitely need to block that with the knight. There's no good way to block that with the g-man. Certainly to block with the g-man is to invite a sacrifice that will bring great regret to white. <clears throat> For example, knight takes pawn, and if pawn is foolish enough to take pawn, queen takes g3 check, and now the king is forced to d1, and bam. It's going to be the loss of a rook at the very least, if not more. So the knight has to block. He wants to get off the rim anyway uh, and obstruct the bishop. e5 now. d takes e5. And here... Um, he really, he really wants to castle here. I should point out that castling, if black were to try to play e4 here, and f takes e4, and say bishop takes knight, and rook takes bishop, and f takes e4 here. Now, this is horrific for black. White, there's a trap here. Now, white can just take this rook with check, but he can actually take the pawn with his knight. And here's the point. You cannot take the knight because after check with the bishop on c4, or even with the queen on b3 check, either way, the king cannot run to h8. If he does, he's checkmated. So therefore, the rook has to block. And when that happens, well, you're giving check again. And the game is all but over already for black. So keep that situation in mind. It's one of the weaknesses when you have this. These pieces are all blocking. These rooks are not connected. Black has to be so careful. <clears throat> so in other words, white can go ahead and make his king safe without fear of harassment from black. Truth is, if white castles, black's best move is not going to be to try to attack in the center. If he's going to move this pawn at all, he should just trade it off for the d-pawn and something like this. So don't worry about that bishop. All right, D takes E5, Queen takes E5, 
Now white castles. Bishop e7. Still wondering about these guys sleeping in their beds. This guy got up, but then he hits, hit the snooze button and came back to bed. Well, he's awake. He's just not doing anything except maybe using this rook's hat for a, a bowl for his oats as he's nibbling oats out of the rook's hat. And the rook doesn't mind because he sure doesn't have anything to do. Knight to e2. And uh, pawn to b6 now opens a possible square up for this bishop. C takes b6, A takes b6, gives some fresh air to the rook. And now black is beginning to get out of this bind. Knight to d4, super attacks the c6 pawn. He's only got one defender. And so c5 attacks this knight and gets the pawn to safety. Knight to b5. Knight to c6. Now we're talking. Bishop to c3. Queen to b8. Rook f to d1. Knight to e5. And here's a move that, it's not a bad move per se. It's just that black, and it's one of my hobby horses, I guess you could say. You've heard me say it over and over and over again. Get your pieces out of bed. So I prefer a move like bishop e6 here. Get that bishop out of his bed. Well, he played knight e5, bishop e2, and, and you are going to see a lot of slide puzzling, or what I call slide puzzling in chess. It's what these grandmasters do. They move one piece to make room for the other. They move the other to make room for the one. They slide this here to open that there. It's really um, interesting, especially if you know what they're doing. I have to confess, half the time I have no idea what they're doing. But it's one of the weaknesses of those of us who are sub-expert level chess players. Uh, because we always want to go forward, forward, forward. It's hard for us to really appreciate the value of the back and forth movements and the backwards movements and the sideways movements. It, it's hard for those of us who are rank amateurs to really appreciate that kind of chess. And it would be nice to hear the commentary of some of those who play slide puzzle chess to give an explanation why that move is played. Now, what his goal is. What is he trying to accomplish? Knight h3. This knight now has... <laughs> It started on g1, it played to f3, it played to g5, it played to h3, it played to f2, now it's back on h3. Rook d8. Bishop f1. Knight f7. And now he moves the knight for a sixth time. That's the sixth time this knight has moved out of 25 moves. So that's almost one out of every four moves. 25% of the time. Well, Chigorin strikes at this bishop here with pawn to d4. Bishop to d2. And here, I would, I would say, if I'm black, you couldn't do it back here. 
It would have been nice to play g5 back here, but you can't do that back here because after bishop takes and bishop takes, well, okay, you're giving up this pawn to attack that bishop, but the rook can take here. And when the rook takes, um, well, bishop e6 could hit that. You could give the material back, but here eventually white is going to emerge on top. So you can't play it at that juncture. But now that this diagonal is closed, um, and now that the bishop has been pushed back, black can push this knight back again. Make a move the seventh time, in other words. He played d takes e3. But now g5 would really be a luscious move, because where's this knight going to go? This is hot. This is hot. This is hot. This is hot. This is not hot. Neither this nor this. But both of these moves block the king's bishop. And this move puts the knight right back on the rim, which is dim. So I really like g5 here. He played d takes e3. And bishop takes e3. And white's pieces are all fairly active. This is the main minor that's... Still got nothing to do, and this rook has to get out of bed yet. But after captures, captures. White's looking pretty decent. Now, you may be wondering about this a2 pawn. After all, the rook can capture it. But if he does, rook takes a2. Notice bishop c4. And when the rook makes his way to safety, queen to b3, and black's in big, big trouble. He's going to lose that knight. He has no way to defend it. So the pawn is poisoned. And queen e5, well, it does attack the bishop. But after rook e1, black is a bit exposed. I think, again, maybe put the question to this knight. With the G-man, this queen is going to be under heat very quickly. King F8. There it is, bishop D2. And the queen has to go back to B8. A lot of wasted moves by both sides, really. But it is part of this whole slide puzzle thing that I keep talking about. That's my name for it. I, I you know, you've played the slide puzzle where you got to put the numbers in order. And in order to do that, you got to make room here by sliding this over there. Well, that's what takes place on the chessboard in many instances. Suddenly, black is kind of backed up again here. Queen b3. Knight to d8. Get the bishop here. I guess he could take it. He takes. But of course, once you take, you're hitting that 
bishop, he'd have to move to c1. White's doing great here either way. Yeah, black is just not in a good place. Queen e2, e3, building the battery against that bishop. Queen b7, bishop c4, beginning to form the mating net. Queen d7. Bishop c3. Rook a4. Bishop b3 hits the rook. He goes back, um, but... Yeah, he goes back. He can't take this knight. For a second there, I'm like, why isn't he taking the knight? The knight is protected by the bishop and the king. You can't take because you're checkmated in a single move. So, no, you can't take it. So, rook back to a8. Knight d5. Knight takes, bishop takes, rook back to a4. I thought this is a crazy move here. I don't think it's necessary. Just go back where you came from. Hit the rook again. The rook can never really go anywhere. So just send him back again. Not sure why you have to give up this bishop. I mean, there's no wrong way to win a chess game. Maybe he's just simplifying. But I don't know how the other bishop can be overpowered. You've got two attackers. One defender. Overpower! So maybe that's the point. So he's not really giving up the bishop per se. He's getting a pawn for a bishop. Uh, no, he's getting a pawn. A bishop for a bishop and a pawn. Okay. Yeah, I guess I can accept that, huh? It's a good thing. I approve of William Steinitz's, uh, Wilhelm Steinitz's approach here. <laughs> so he overpowers, simplifies. I don't know. It seems like it does give white a little more activity and simplification. So I guess I can't take grievance with it. But I did like the idea of just getting this rook back out of play. But I'm nowhere near as good as Wilhelm Steinitz was, so... King takes, queen takes, queen takes, rook takes, check. King f6. And uh, that leaves this pawn. So that can be taken. Knight d6 strikes the bishop. Bishop e6 interrogates... His counterpart, bishops are traded. Is it really better to take with the king than at least try to get the knight back into the game? Well, I mean, white has a clear advantage here. You got this pass pawn here. You got five pawns to three. So it's not like he's going to hold on to this. B3. B5. 
check. Hmm. I'm not sure about the, his goal in that move. Black didn't take it. Okay, I guess the idea is you're trading pawns. <clears throat> And now you've got two outside passed pawns. So that may be why he chose not to take. <laughs> and white captures the pawn anyway. Well, I mean, he could have captured this one and made three passed pawns. But I guess he liked the idea of having a passed pawn on each side. So he decided to give up his knight. Here you don't even have to give up your knight and you get three pass pawns. All right. Well, who can argue with Steinitz? He's going to win this game either way, it seems. Rook takes knight. Oh, I see. See that? Steinitz rubs my face in it. And says, Dunderhead, maybe I need some coffee. <clears throat> I should have seen that fork. I mean, it's so obvious a blind caveman could have found that. <laughs> rook takes d8, rook to a5, rook to d5, king to b4, rook to d2, hangs on to that, king to c3, rook to e2, and here black resigned. Because it's clear that white just has too much extra stuff. And black is not going to be able to stop everything. If he's going to be able to stop anything, his king has to stop these two pawns. His rook has to reposition and try to stop these pawns. Meanwhile... He's got these two targets just sitting there and unprotected. So let's say, okay, so he resigned here. If he tries to relocate the bishop, I think, um, or the bishop, that's called the rook in chess moves. I think you just get your pawns a rolling. And even if the rook tries to swing over, Anywhere along here, let's just say rook h8, pawn to h4 can be played, rook to g8, king to f2. The rook can't stop everything, the, the king can't stop everything. Um, you know, if he tries saying, okay, let's do this and just get pawns on one side. The other pawn's going to fall. White's going to abandon this pawn. He doesn't care about it. I mean, there are a lot of ways to win this game. Probably might as well push it forward anyway. Make the king come over. Well, guess what? The king is now cut off here. The rook can't defend everything. So you say, okay, I'm going to stop you from moving this pawn. Um, White's king just advances. You also have the option of just letting go of one pawn to get rid of this last pawn. There's not much black can really do here. In fact, there's nothing black can really do. He's just kind of stuck. Uh, but, <clears throat> all right, so let's keep pushing these pawns. Each pawn is now three steps away from home. And all this guy can do is go back and forth. When you push here, you've now made another passed pawn. What can he do? 
it just keeps stalling, but pretty soon progress will be made and uh, Black has nothing to do here. He's, he's hopeless. Sooner or later, they're both, one side or the other is going to get rolling. The king can never cross this line. So you can never hope, um, you know, you can never trade your rook, that's for sure. So, but everything's up to the rook. I don't even know what he does. If, if he tries to stay in the sixth rank, we're just going to push this pawn. You can't take it without losing your rook and then losing the game here. So, and white just keeps advancing. Okay, maybe, oh, I, you, left your, you left your rook undefended. I'll come and get it. Okay. Oh, oh, now I'm defended again. <laughs> and uh, so you have the same thing, only a rank up further. Well, sooner or later, this is just all going to come to an end at some point. I think everybody can clearly see that one of these pawns is promoting. So I'm not even going to carry it out any further than this. There really shouldn't be any need to. Hopefully, even the most uh, beginner of players would be able to plug this position into the computer and win with the white pieces at the highest level. I mean, you should be able to beat Stockfish 10 with this position, even if you play Stockfish 10 at its highest strength. Uh, go ahead and try it. And your idea, of course, is going to be to keep escorting this pawn, you follow the same pattern. You bring your king up, you bring your pawn up, you bring your other pawn up, and you just keep following that same pattern. If he attacks your king, then you, uh, your rook with his king, once your pawn is here, you just put the rook on the next square, and the king cannot, the rook can't trade itself off because the king cannot chase down both of these pawns way, way, way on the opposite sides of the board. <clears throat> okay, so give it a try. It might be fun. Um, this brings the, the match to a score of 10 games to 6. The, the, the next game, game 17, was the final game. Chagorin would have had to win out the remaining games, the remaining four games, in order to tie the match. Game 17 ended in a draw, so I'm not showing it. Uh, and once it did, the score was 10.5 to 6.5, and, and Steinitz emerged victorious. So he became world champion officially for the second time on uh, February 28th, 1889. And I, I hope you enjoyed this um, match. Next time, Steinitz will face Isidore Gunsberg. And it's quite an interesting turn of events that brought Ginsburg to the championship table. Uh, truthfully, it could have been Max Weiss. Uh, but we'll tell you more about that when we get to that particular sub-series in this overall series of world championship wins. Until then, I hope you have a great day and play some great chess. Bye now.